Special States of America. Citizens United case, one year ago, we said the corporations had the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. With almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Don't you see what's happening in the United States? We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk. I'm host of this series of half-hour weekly cable public access programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media in Portland, Oregon. Today our guest is Dan Meek. Dan Meek is an attorney here in Portland. Uh, he is co-founder of the Independent Party of Oregon. He was known as the nuclear guy when he worked many years ago at Friends of the Earth, and he is an advocate for limiting campaign contributions in elections. And so welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, David. Great, good. So today we want to focus on the Supreme Court and the decisions. Their session just ended a few weeks ago, and they had uh, what I regard as uh, a number of special uh, important decisions, uh, many of which were decided by a 5-4 uh, majority, and so we want to talk about some of those. Okay, well, um, you asked me um, a little while ago, a week or so ago, to uh, address the subject, and since then I've been looking into it and I've been become extremely depressed. <laughs> depressed, okay. <laughs> it was worse than I thought. Okay, because I, I was um, aware of four bad decisions, but I'm sure you probably found more than Actually, that. Actually, there are dozens of them, and I would like to just uh, briefly run through four or five and then focus on two of them. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, a problem is that you really can't get the, uh, the flavor of, of how bad these decisions are without looking into, the, into one or two of them in detail and then understanding the rest of, the rest of them are just as bad. Mm -hmm. okay. And of course, this is on top of the horrendous decisions the Supreme Court has made in the last in the last session, including the Citizens United case, which uh, said that corporations and any other entity can make unlimited independent expenditures in, in, in races for every uh, public office in the United States. And that pretty much did all the work that you've been trying to do. Well, not exactly. Um, many things could have been done, for example, by Congress in order to, um, in order to offset Citizens United. The Congress could have required that these independent expenditures by corporations that uh, the ads that they fund identify exactly who's funding them. But Congress didn't do that even though there were very large majorities in both, of Democratic majorities in both the Senate and the House. At the time that Citizens United came out, they had a full year after that to do something about it. Required disclosure. Uh, they could have, um, in fact, they could have reversed Citizens United simply by passing a law to remove jurisdiction from the U.S. Supreme Court over campaign finance reform laws. The, the, um, the Congress has has pl absolute control over the jurisdiction of the of the U.S. Supreme Court and can take cases out of their jurisdiction whenever it wants to. It's done so many times, but the Democrats didn't even try. They also could have, by law, enlarged the court to 11 members, given President Obama two more members to appoint, 
and then rehear the case and decide it in the other direction, six to five, instead of deciding it the way it was five to four. But you know, that's, that's water under the bridge because what Citizens United accomplished was additional hundreds of millions of dollars going into the campaigns of Republicans for Congress. Uh, using that money, they were able to take the House of Representatives, and so now it would take the agreement of the Republicans and the House of Representatives to do anything to counter Citizens United. So, can, can, it, you, can, it, can, can you speculate about why the Democrats didn't do anything? Well, my belief is that they thought that citizens that uh, unleashing uh, corporations and unions, for that matter, to make unlimited independent expenditures would be good for them. Hmm. In good for the, the establishment Democrats. In, in the 2006 and 2008 cycles, the Democrats actually received more money from corporations than the Republicans did. Uh, and the, their independent expenditures on behalf of Democrats were more than the independent expenditures on behalf of Republicans. So the corporate Democrats, the establishment Democrats, weren't all that concerned about it, and so they did nothing about it. Oh, okay. Of course, that allowed the, the, the corporations to say, well, we don't have to support these Democrats anymore, these Democrats who pretend to be progressives and occasionally you know, take us to the woodshed. We can just support people who absolutely love us mm -hmm. and who will support us no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they did. Oh, see. Okay. So there are tipping points in, in history and turning points, and this was one of them, and the Democrats failed to do anything to counter it until it was too late. Okay. Right. Anyway, yep. this session, um, if anything, it's even worse. Let's look through uh, four or five cases. And I've got um, little summaries of these cases from an organization called Alliance for Justice, and their summaries appear to be pretty accurate. The first one, um, first slide, is Arizona Free Enterprise Club versus Bennett. This is the, the case where the, um, the Supreme Court, these are all five to four decisions, um, uh, struck down Arizona's system for public funding of candidates for state and local offices. Um, I'll get into this in more detail because it's one of the two cases I want to look in in greater detail. Okay, yeah, because this is one of the ones that I had on, mm -hmm. in particular, that I wanted to focus right. on also. But it basically it says that any public funding system that provides more public funding to a candidate based upon how much money his op opponent raises or spends is unconstitutional because it somehow impairs the free speech of his opponent. Um, the, uh, the next case, uh, which is probably the worst of all, and certainly I think the worst of all, AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. And again, a five to four majority gave corporations the ability to cheat consumers or discriminate against workers on a massive scale, knowing that if they are caught, they can be only held accountable one consumer or worker at a time. We'll get into that in greater detail. It, mm -hmm. Basically, the case eliminates the opportunity for class actions. Uh, so consumers can't bring class actions, workers can't bring class actions. In fact, it totally private allows corporations to totally privatize the justice system so that any, if you ever have a dispute with a corporation, you don't go to the court system. Hmm. Where do you go? You go to the private system of private arbitration where arbitrators are selected by the corporations. They have no incentive to rule in favor of, con of the consumer they're, uh, they're just, we'll get into it okay. in, in greater detail. Sorry. Third case you may have heard of, Walmart versus Dukes. Five to four majority created new impossible to hurdle thresholds for women and people of color to prove widespread gender or racial discrimination in the workplace. In this decision, the Supreme Court said that you know, women were uh, suing Walmart, uh, women employees there, for what they said was a pattern and practice of discrimination which was proven in part by the statistics showing that basically Walmart had, that women were very heavily underrepresented uh, beyond you know, the, the, the absolute low floor level, supervisors. So on the supervisory level, they were very underrepresented. Supreme Court said, well, you know, you can't, you can't use these statistics uh, if you're bringing a class action. You have to prove that there was a policy of deliberate discrimination. And look here, it says right here in the Walmart manual, uh, our policy is not to discriminate. So that proves it. So that proves it. Right. So they immunize themselves yeah. from uh, liability for employment discrimination by saying that's not our policy. And the Supreme Court said, well, if they do that, then you know, obviously it's up to each individual supervisor to decide who to promote, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so you can't have a class action because there are no common issues. Oh. You really have to focus on every the decisions made by every individual supervisor. Was, um, this, was this the decision that was a seven to two decision? Um, no. No. Okay. This, this was a five-four. This was a this was a five-four decision. Okay. Um, that, as it happens in many Supreme 
court cases, or at least some now, various issues are decided by different majorities. But the issue about uh, class certification was a 5-4 decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the next case was called uh, Pliva versus Mensing, um, which said that uh, there is there is federal preemption uh, when it comes to liability for generic drug manufacturers uh, for the adverse effects of their drugs. Um, un the court said that under federal law, the only thing the drug that generic drug manufacturers have to do is to print the same warning that the brand label uh, manufacturer has, even though there's new information has become available since the time that that label was printed. And so even if, as the, as the slide said, even for drugs which cause irreversible neuro neurological disorders, um, as long as the label of the drug was the same label that was on the, um, the, um, the non-generic, that is the brand label drug several years ago, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that preempts liability under mm -hmm. state law. Um, the next case, Janus Capital Group versus First Derivative Traders, uh, a, a very complex case. Again, a five to four majority opened a loophole for corporations to mislead investors and to shunt responsibility for fraud onto subsidiaries who may have been unaware of the deception and don't have any assets to cover the losses anyway. Um, it's, this case is very difficult to describe in less than several minutes, so I won't attempt okay. to do so. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Schindler Elevator Corporation versus the United States. This is about the whistleblower laws that established a, a reward system for folks to uh, blow the whistle on like you know, corporations they work for if those corporations are de defrauding the United States, hmm. the United States government, particularly government contractors. And what this decision said is that, well, um, you don't get any whistleblower reward um, if uh, the information that uh, that the case was based on came from a federal report. That is, you know, we knew about it. Any basically, we knew about it. The federal government knew about it anyway. Uh -huh. But in this case, it was a someone went, used a Freedom of Information Act request to develop the information. And they said, well, that's the same thing as a report. You don't get any. You don't get any reward. And of course, the Supreme Court, in other ways, has, has eviscerated whistleblower protection so that anyone who blows the whistle on their own corporation really isn't protected from being from being fired uh, or even having having being sued by the corporation that they blew the whistle on. Hmm. So these these seem bad, but as you get into the details, they are even worse. So the two cases, the first of all, the public funding case, uh, Arizona. Um, uh, Freedom, uh, FEC, what does that stand for? That's Free Enterprise Club uh, versus <laughs> Bennett. This slide describes very briefly what the um, Arizona public funding system does, which was this system was adopted by initiative about fi about 15 years ago. So if you if you want to get public funding for your campaign in, in Arizona, you have to go out and get a certain number of $5 contributions from voters. If you're running for the legislature, it's 200 of them. If you're running for governor, for example, it's 4,000 of them. If you then qualify for public funding, if you're running for governor, you get an initial grant of $707,000 in this cycle. If you're running for the legislature, for example, you get an additional grant of 21,000. Now compare this to the amounts that are spent for these races in Oregon. The last governor's race, um, the folks spent $20 million. Um, and the, the basically, you're not in the game if you don't have at least five million dollars to spend. Arizona, as a state, has a lot larger population than Oregon does, but their publicly funded candidates get seven hundred and seven thousand. Their house, their legislative candidates, twenty one thousand. In Oregon, a contested house seat, house race. Now, the winner basically spends seven hundred thousand dollars, which is thirty times as much. Um, so these, you know. Elections in in Arizona run on a lot smaller amounts mm -hmm. of money. Yeah. And, and if they were not publicly funded uh, in Arizona, do you have an idea? Can you give us an idea how much a, a, a privately financed candidate for governor, for instance, would have would have spent? Um, I don't have that with me, but it's much much less because Arizona has the most stringent limits on private contributions of any state mm. uh, because it has a, a formula that involves inflation. But currently, no individual in a, for, for all statewide races together can contribute more than an aggregate of about $800 in an election cycle. 
Really? In Oregon, it's an infinite amount mm -hmm. for all, for each candidacy for 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 each individual in an election cycle. Mm -hmm. In also the same thing is true in legislative races. If you want to support people running for the legislature, in a two-year cycle, if you're a person, if you're any person in an, involved in an Arizona race, or in contributing to an Arizona race, you can only contribute 800 bucks. That's it for, and that's for everybody. That's for all the candidates that you want to support. Wow. So Arizona has the most stringent mm -hmm. limitations on contributions, and of course they ban corporate and union contributions as well. And the the Citizens United case wouldn't affect those? Doesn't affect the contribution limits, no. In fact, this Arizona FEC case, uh, the, sub, the, sub, the majority in the Supreme Court case actually said that, um, actually went out of its way to, to validate these low Arizona limits, saying, how do you fight corruption? You know, well, you don't fight it with this, with this public funding, but you fight it with these low, with these Arizona has extremely low limits, and that's what fights corruption. Mm -hmm. So that is a slight silver lining that the that the even the the, the majority in the Oregon in the Arizona case up went out of its way to validate or or praise the extremely low limits mm -hmm. on contributions that Arizona had. Okay. Now, the the feature of the Arizona system that was. Um, uh, put into into question was that if a privately financed candidate, someone who doesn't opt for public funding, um, spends more, let's say, than twenty-one thousand dollars that the that the legislative candidate, mm -hmm. publicly funded candidate, has, then the Arizona system would match the additional dollars on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, up to twice as much more than in this case, up to an additional forty-two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Over that, the privately funded candidate can, of course, raise as much money as they can possibly raise under the under the, the limits in Arizona and the publicly funded candidate doesn't get any more than that 21,000 plus 42,000 if they're running for the legislature. Now the Supreme Court majority agreed that the Arizona system would be valid if it simply made larger initial grants that if it just made the $63,000 grant in the first place that would be okay. Mm -hmm. Instead the Arizona system made a $21,000 grant and then didn't make the $42,000 grant until uh, until and unless the opponents raised money. So mm -hmm. basically the Arizona system attempts to conserve tax taxpayer money, not spend unnecessary money mm -hmm. um, in uncontested races for example. But the Supreme Court uh, said no, no, no. If it, you can't um, provide more public money in response to the opponent opposing candidate raising raising money uh, from from private sources. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a horrible decision, but one that is even worse is ATT Mobility versus uh, Concepcion. The majority ruled that corporations can include in contracts provisions requiring the disputes go to ar arbitration instead of court. Now, this this involves virtually everything that you do. This involves all the contracts that you would have for like your for utilities. For your for your telephone service, for your in your for your banking, credit cards, that also involves employment contracts that you would have, um, and uh, it the there's a 1925 Federal Arbitration Act, which merely stated that parties uh, to contracts can agree to arbitration if they want to, mm -hmm. but now of course we have what are called contracts of adhesion which means that if you want a cell phone, if you want a job, you have to sign a contract that you agree to send all disputes to arbitration. Mm -hmm. Now, California had a, has a law, um, the federal law, by the way, says that the arbitration agreement is valid save upon such grounds as exist at law or in equity for the revocation of any contract. So the federal law says, yeah, you can agree to arbitration, and arbitration contracts are valid, but the same as any other contract is valid or not valid. California law, as the slide indicates, invalidates um, provisions in contracts where, it re where, for example, a phone company would require its customers to waive the opportunity to bring a class action, where disputes predictably involve small amounts of damages, and when it's alleged that the party has carried out a scheme to deliberately cheat large numbers of cust yeah. consumers out of individually small sums of money. Um, so it's the classic circumstance when a class action is the only way to get a remedy. That is, let's say that the phone company decides, well, we're just going to tack on 30 bucks to everybody's bill. That's essentially what, what happened here. Mm -hmm. 
the phone companies are offering free phones. But if you sign up for the free phones, you got over $30 tacked onto your bill for sales tax. Oh, Even right. though the utility, the phone company, the cell phone company, wasn't paying sales tax because they weren't making a sale. The sale mm -hmm. was at zero price. So they were charging you for taxes they don't pay. Well, is, that sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, and, and then the phones would probably not, assuming the tax was 10%, the, the phones are probably not worth $300 in the first place. Well, in any event, what a phone company can do now, or anyone can do now, is can they could simply just add a $30 charge. Oh, we just added a $30 charge, $50, $100 charge to your bill. We let people slam your bill, which the phone companies do. I mean, you see um, horrendous uh, additions to your bill, like $19.99 a month for products, for services you didn't order. Mm -hmm. You know, friend chat line or whatever, you didn't order it. Of course, the phone companies do that because they get a cut of the action. Mm -hmm. um, but under this, under this new Supreme Court ruling, you can't do anything about it because um, uh, they, they dramatically misinterpret, of course, federal law by saying that um, when the state law says that you can't, uh, you know, that it's an invalid contract and that you, to say that you can't bring a class action if a company is cheating you out of small, is cheating large amounts of people out of small amounts of money, mm -hmm. well, that somehow impairs this arbitration agreement that, um, that, the, that um, the 19, supposedly the 1925 Arbitration Act mm -hmm. um, favors. Now, as pointed out here in the slide, the Federal Arbitration Act expressly recognizes the validity of state laws pertaining to contracts, such as this California law against unconscionable contracts, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, they, they throw it out. The majority, the five to four majority, criticized the inefficiency of class arbitration, but of course, no one suggested that the class arbitration is the alternative to individual arbitration. The alternative is, of course, class action in court. Now, what's very most important is what is never stated in this decision. The decision never describes what arbitration is about. Arbitration is the complete privatization of the justice system. In the justice system, that's, that's the courts that we have. Judges are either elected, as they are, as all of them are in Oregon, or are appointed by elected officials with confirmation by the legislature. Um, there are uh, opportunities, there are rights to discovery where you get to use, where you get to force the other side to produce relevant information even if it's, if, even if it's harmful to the other side's case. There is a system of appeals. If you think that the, the trial court judge has made a mistake, then you get to appeal it to the Court of Appeals. If they've made a mistake, you get to appeal it to the state Supreme Court. So it is a, it's a very carefully worked out justice system that is, that is a fundamental part of, of, mm -hmm. of rights in America. Mm -hmm. Arbitration is totally different. In arbitration, your dispute is decided by an arbitrator. Well, where does this arbitrator come from? It's just, just a private lawyer who signs up for an arbitration panel. Typically, the, the uh, arbitration process is that e both sides are presented with a panel of five names, selected at, supposedly selected at random from a panel of persons who have signed up to be arbitrators. And the, you get to strike out a couple of, you know, a couple of them uh, in order to come to the, to the decision of, of the one who decides the case. Well, the consumer isn't going to know any of these people, has no idea who to strike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The corporation knows these people because they've seen them before and they know who has ruled in their favor before. They know who to strike. And if any arbitrator um, develops a reputation for ruling against the corporation, the corporation just strikes them from the next, from the next time they show up on the panel. So the panels are, are absolutely guaranteed to rule in the vast majority of cases against the corporation. In addition, under, under federal law, let's say the arbitrator makes a completely wrong decision under the law. Let's say it's totally illegal to charge rate payers for income taxes you don't pay. But the arbitrator says, well, huh, who cares, you know, we'll let them do it. Hmm. Wrong decision, wrong on the law. Well, mm -hmm. that's not grounds for appeal of an arbitration decision. Oh, so no the, only, appeal. the only grounds for appeal is if you can prove that basically that the arbitrator's decision was based on fraud. Basically, you have to prove that the arbitrator was bribed, hmm. which of course you can't prove. So, um, any rights that consumers have um, to fair treatment and to to have their contracts upheld and to and not only in in all consumer transactions but in employment transactions anything you can think of 
is essentially destroyed by this case. Now, now the, the silver lining here is that this is based on a federal statute. Mm -hmm. okay. Congress can just change it, bingo. Okay, but likelihood of that happening? Well, that's up to, that's up to our representatives in Congress. We now have a Republican majority in the House. The likelihood is that it, is, is that it won't be changed. Mm -hmm. However, I would point out on okay, two uh, my last slide here, confirmation votes. I went back to see whether we would have these. These are the five justices who are ruling against the people in all of these cases. Would we have these five justices if the Democrats were in control of the legislature at the time they were confirmed? Mm -hmm. Scalia was confirmed 98 to nothing. The Democrats voted 47 to 0 in favor of him. Justice Kennedy was confirmed 97 to nothing. The Democrats had a 54 to 46 majority. They all voted for him. Thomas, on the other hand, was barely confirmed 52 to 48. Uh, the Democrats voted against him predominantly. Roberts, who is really the ringleader of these decisions, mm -hmm. the Democrats voted for him 22 to 22. And finally, Alito, the Democrats voted against him 42 to four, um, but he was uh, confirmed anyway, Republican majority. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so at least in a, a, um, a couple of these cases, they wouldn't be on the Supreme Court if the Democrats had, had voted no. Had voted no, that's right. Okay. right and of course, all of these decisions are five to four. If even one of these folks were placed on the court, it would make a difference. Okay. And of course, Congress, when it had overwhelming Democratic majorities in 2010, could have enlarged the court to 11 members, failed to do so. Mm -hmm. All right, we have, we have a minute and a half left, really quickly, so I can get my finish done also. Any idea what the court will be looking at in, in their upcoming session? No. No. This was okay. too, looking at what they have already done was uh, too yeah, depressing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm sure it will get, I'm sure it will get worse. I'm uh, sure it will too, right, yeah, okay. Good, so we've been talking with Dan Meek, uh, who's a Portland attorney, uh, and a uh, citizen activist, campaigned uh, many times for limiting campaign contributions, and uh, so we're at the end of our program. We need to thank our, our, get our uh, crew today. Our crew today was Janet Morris, Virginia Hammond, Roger Bates, Tom Thomas, Hollis Benedict, and Joan Horton. Uh, at the, uh, usually at the beginning of the show, I, I, I suggest that people should uh, go to our websites and learn more about the Alliance for Democracy. So our, our website address is in Portland, uh, afd-pdx.org. Our national website is thealliancefordemocracy.org. And I also want to let people know that the Move to Mend Portland group now has a website up also, which is movetomendpdx.org. So I invite you to uh, take a look at that also. Thank you very much, and I hope that you'll return next week.